Hello and welcome to Education Edge, your one-stop shop for all certification needs. Last week, we talked about lesson number one of PMI authorized PMP exam prep version 3.0. Here, version 3.0, released in January 2023. This week, we are going to look at lesson number two, starting the project. Now, it's very important to understand that when you're about to start the project, look into uh, the entire organization, look into the business environment of your organization. And that environment, as we talked about uh, uh, it last week, constitutes PMI said topic, it could be foundation, uh, but it constitutes, apart from foundation, it constitutes the strategic alignment, number one. Number two, uh, the business environment constitutes the benefits and value. Good project managers must understand it right in the beginning. Number three, good project managers in the beginning during their discovery and understanding business environment will also focus on organizational culture and change management. What kind of governance exists and how we are going to leverage it for our own project and developing understanding of compliance-based requirements, especially working in highly regulated industries. Good project managers will focus on six topics, but topic A is just the foundation talking about projects and project management, but topic B to topic E are extremely important uh, from uh, exam standpoint. So that was lesson A, lesson, lesson one. Now we uh, went through uh, lesson one thoroughly. Today we'll be taking a look at Lesson number two, starting the project. This lesson is a light lesson with two core principles. One, identification of stakeholders must be done as early as possible. Number two, developing shared understanding with the project team. Those are the two core principles of lesson one, but PMI has also added for a team and various different approaches that could be used to plan and execute your project. So there are four topics. Let's just take a look at what these four topics are and let's start this by sharing our deck. Share, and there we are. So today on agenda, we have lesson number two. My name is Heman Tharyal and I will be your coach. Uh, and I will drive you through this journey of getting PMP certified. Today on agenda, we have lesson number two, starting the project. There are four topics listed as part of this lesson. What are these four topics? Number one, when you start the project, identify your stakeholders as early as possible. Not only identify them, but also analyze them. Identify your stakeholders. List them in a stakeholder register or some kind of a document. B, uh, topic B for starting the project or start the project lesson two. Topic B is about start forming the team. Start building that core team. In the beginning, the team size will be relatively small, but the process of starting to think about forming the team must start at this stage. Once you start forming the team, even if the team size is small, ensure that you start building shared understanding the project with the team. You build share understanding by developing the project charter and communicating it. You build share understanding by having kickoff meetings, not just one, but you could have a number of kickoff meetings. You build share understanding by communicating the vision to the team, extremely important. And you build share understanding sometimes by yourself understanding the business need by reviewing some business document, such as the business case and the benefit management plan. And topic D, PMI has dedicated some real estate here for uh, approaches. 
look at the right approach for your project. Would it be predictive? Would it be adaptive? With, uh, would it be hybrid combination of both? Now, approaches. Now, keep this in mind, but really the idea of approach, what project approach would be used on a certain project is generally decided before you start the project. And this approach is generally part of the business case. Keep that in mind. It's really important to understand. PMI said, let's just put, uh, give, give some kind of, uh, you know, uh, space to approaches uh, because it's critical uh, as PMI is slowly leaning towards more adaptive approaches. So we'll be taking a look at these four topics. Now, from exam standpoint, folks, identify stakeholders is extremely important. You must focus on this topic and building shared understanding of the project. It is expected that when you start uh, the PMP course, you have sound understanding of predictive, adaptive, and hybrid approaches. So topic D would serve as a nice refresher, but if you wanted to know more about what these predictive and adaptive approaches are, you can always go back to my web website, www.educationedge.ca, and there you can look at our resource section, and under the resource section, go to the Knowledge Center, and you will find a video on all about predictive and adaptive projects. Topic A, identify stakeholders, right? Identification of stakeholders and starting to engage them. Now, when PMI speaks about identification of stakeholders, they are not just talking about documenting the name, the role, the department, and the responsibility of the stakeholders. They also want us to further analyze our stakeholders. So when the word identify stakeholder is used, it constitutes not only identification of stakeholders or documenting the stakeholders, but also understanding their level of power or authority, also understanding their level of influence, their level of in, uh, interest, their level of complexity, and to some extent, their uh, level of expectations uh, from the project. So two parts, identify high level information about your stakeholders and then analyze it further. Why should we analyze our stakeholder? Recently, this was one of the PMP exam questions. Why should we analyze our stakeholders? We identify them. Why should we analyze? When we analyze our stakeholders, we are able to understand what will be the priority of stakeholders. And this priority, when we know priority of our stakeholders, then we say, well, high priority stakeholders must be managed very closely or kept satisfied, right? So it's very important to understand this idea of identification of stakeholders. Now, who are these stakeholders? Let's define our stakeholders. So let's just go here and change the layout a little bit here to blank maybe. Here we go. We can just copy this. Now, who are these stakeholders? How do we define these stakeholders? Stakeholders. Stakeholders could be an individual. Stakeholder could be a group or a group or an organization unit or the entire org sometimes, entire organization. That is directly or indirectly 
negatively or positively impacted. Impacted by what? Impacted by the execution or outcome of your project. So if you take a look at this mind map here, it says stakeholders could be an individual, a group, or an, an, or, or an organization unit, or sometimes even the entire organization that is directly or indirectly negatively or positively impacted by the execution or the outcome of a project. If a certain stakeholder does not fit this definition, that stakeholders should not be documented in your stakeholder register. So, some rules from PMP exam standpoint. Identify stakeholders. Do this early in the life cycle, early in the life cycle of the project. Document the stakeholders in a document called stakeholder register. Don't forget to analyze them because analysis will give you the priority of the stakeholders. Moving on to our next slide. So we talked about who these stakeholders are, right? So let's take a look at what does a stakeholder register look like a stakeholder register is a placeholder it is a document where all your stakeholders will be listed and this register should be made readily available to the stakeholders very important to understand it should be made readily available however now this is pmp exam question however some portions of the stakeholder register may be kept hidden because it may contain some confidential or maybe sensitive information. So keep that idea in mind. So how does a stakeholder register look like? Let's take a look at that. So stakeholder register is more like a spreadsheet. Contains the number, the name of the stakeholder. It could contain the department they belong to. It could contain the role and responsibility of the stakeholders. It could also contain their expectations. This is good information, right? This is good information, their expectations. This is all good information. But looking at this information about stakeholders right here, all these different stakeholders listed, this does not help me understand the priority of the stakeholders. So how do I understand the priority of the stakeholders? To understand the priority of the stakeholder, we further, we further identify certain attributes of our stakeholders. For example, things such as what will be the power of certain stakeholder? It could be high, medium, or low? What would be the influence of the stakeholder? It could again be high, medium, or low. What is the level of interest of the stakeholder in the project? It could also be high, medium, or low. What is the attitude of the stakeholder towards the project? They may have great attitude. They may be leading the project. They may also not show up in your meeting because they might consider your project to be not that important for them. So, attitude of the stakeholder. Imagine you wrote down here some stakeholder has doesn't have great attitude towards the project. They don't show up on the meeting and all that. If you wrote down something like that about a stakeholder, what would happen? If they and and stakeholder register should be made readily available to stakeholders. Now they looked at it and. They're not going to 
take your project in good light once they see this? What do you think? Would they? I don't think so. That is why some portions of stakeholder register may be kept hidden because they may contain some sensitive information. Now, this part of stakeholder register right here, this is good information here. This is good information, but really what makes a stakeholder register an extremely powerful document is this information here. This information helps you analyze your stakeholders. The information such as what is their power? Is it high, medium or low? What is their influence? Is it high, medium or low? What is their interest? High, medium or low? What is their kind of, what kind of uh, attitude do they have? What is their level of complexity? If you wanted to further add one more column to that. Sometimes we also like to add things like geographical location of our stakeholders to our stakeholder register so that we can create a sound communication plan. We can choose the right communication method for our stakeholders. So this is what a stakeholder register is. Identify them, document them in stakeholder register, and then analyze them by understanding their power, influence, interest, and attitude. Now look, stakeholders that have high power and high influence, what happens? They become your high priority stakeholders. Imagine you have 500, you're working in a mega project for, let's just say, uh, New York City. You're working on a mega project. You have you have this uh, Ellis Dawn executing this project, multi-million dollar projects, a $500 million. Imagine the number of stakeholders that will be involved on this project. Think about it a little bit. Think about uh, uh, this, these number number of stakeholders that will be involved. Imagine the level of work. Imagine if you have to engage each and every stakeholder. This project will never end. There will be chaos all the time. So good project managers and good teams, what they do, they do in the beginning itself, itself is that they identify all the stakeholders who will be directly or negative, uh, directly or indirectly, positively or negatively impacted by the outcome of your project or execution of your project. They analyze these stakeholders by capturing attributes such as the power, influence, interest, and attitude. High power, high influence, high interest stakeholders generally become, now we add another column, high priority stakeholders. And these high priority stakeholders on top could be the stakeholders that you continue to work with and manage closely. And the rest of the stakeholders, you may keep them informed and you may monitor them throughout, right? So PMI also created, so this is what is a stakeholder register, uh, document your stakeholders early on, but keep, keep in mind that stakeholders can be identified throughout the life cycle of a project. Let's just take a look at this. Stakeholders, so let's just, it's very important from exam standpoint. There's generally a question on this on the exam. Stakeholders could be identified throughout throughout the life cycle of the project of the project now, take a look at this life cycle you start the project or you initiate the project the project goes into planning the project is executed and the project gets closed monitoring and controlling of projects happens throughout the project now take a look at this you try to create ideally you would like to create your stakeholder register here but you hired three resources at the end of planning right here these resources also got added to the stakeholder register during execution one of the regulatory body 
uh, or three stakeholders from regulatory body were ad identified. These stakeholders also got added and analyze, add, analyze, add. add. So stakeholders can be added or removed from your stakeholder register throughout the life cycle of a project. But the moment you add a stakeholder, they must be analyzed. And those stakeholders that are high priority stakeholders based on their power, interest or influence must be managed closely or kept satisfied. So stakeholders, must be identified as early as possible. Identify them as early as possible. But identification of stakeholders is a continuous process and continues to happen throughout the life cycle of a project. Anytime a stakeholder is identified, they must be analyzed. Why do we analyze the stakeholders? Because we want to understand their priority. When we understand the priority of stakeholders, it is at this time we are now ready to engage them in that right manner, the appropriate manner, right? Creating that right engagement level. So PMI also put together a stakeholder register. When you take a look at this book called PMI Authorized PMP Exam Prep, available with all the ATPs, you would be able to see this template there. But the template that we created is far superior to what PMI has put together here. We have more clarity there. Now, in the exam, I don't think this is important, but there are these different kinds of grid, but power and interest grid is one of the most popular grids that helps you understand, uh, that helps you understand how you would, how would you manage your stakeholders? right? Uh, power and interest grid. Let's just build it together. What does that mean? So power and interest grid, something like this. Right here. So let's take a look at this right here. Take a look at this. Let's say on the Y axis, we have power of stakeholder, which could be low to high. And on X axis, we have the interest of stakeholders, which could be low to high again. So let's just make quadrants here. Now let's say a stakeholder has high power and high interest. So a stakeholder has high power and high interest. Let's say they fall here. Sam falls on this top right quadrant. High power, high interest. When a stakeholder has high power and high interest, you manage them closely. You got to memorize this folks from exam standpoint because you will get questions around this. You manage them closely. Now let's say Mary, another stakeholder, has high power but low interest. Look, Mary is another stakeholder. She has high power but low interest. Mary needs to be, you've got to keep her satisfied. So Mary, keep her satisfied. So any stakeholder that falls on the top left corner, top left corner must be kept satisfied. Now, a stakeholder may have high interest but low power, or they may maybe fall somewhere here. They have high interest but low power. Let's say Simon has high interest but low power. Should be, Simo should be kept informed. And a stakeholder has low power and low interest. You keep them in monitor state. Keep in mind, you know, uh, stakeholders, they mutate. Today, 
you may find the stakeholder to be uh, to have low power and maybe high interest. Tomorrow they may get promoted and they end up coming on the top, top uh, right or top left quadrant. Now, uh, that is why it's very important to keep all the stakeholders in monitor state, but some stakeholders, we will manage them closely and some stakeholders will keep them satisfied. And these stakeholders generally become your high priority stakeholders. A great way of classifying your stakeholders. And when you understand those high priority stakeholders that will be managed closely and kept satisfied, what do you do? During that time, now you can create an engagement plan for these stakeholders and either manage them closely based on their power and interest or keep them satisfied. Now, a stakeholder, this is this right here, this, these four quadrants, they're called the stakeholder map. In the PMP exam, PMI may give you questions such as, how does this stakeholder get treated? You will have to say, keep it informed. They may say, hey, by the way, on the, on the bottom left, how do you uh, how do you engage this kind of more keep them in monitor stage and they may say well what about this stakeholder on top left quad quadrant manage them closely so you need to know how you manage these stake how how do we engage with certain stakeholders who fall in uh, these different quadrants now a great tool really a great tool uh, to uh, to be able to a great tool to be able to classify your stakeholder and this tool is called stakeholder map. Now in recent PMP exam, they've also used this other term called uh, called the cube. Now cube is three dimensional, right? Three dimensional. In a stakeholder map, there are two dimensions, power and interest. Add attitude to it, it becomes a cube. Now you are analyzing stakeholders, classifying stakeholders using three different dimensions. Cube uh, is that uh, another classification tool. And uh, apart, apart from looking at the power and interest, like the stakeholder map, it also adds a new dimension to it, the third dimension. And we also analyze stakeholders based on attitude some powerful tools that are available to us to understand our stakeholders analyze them better and understand the level of engagement that will be required for these stakeholders now in the pmp exam there is there are questions on uh, salience model now salience model is a stakeholder now in the exam if you just knew this uh classification model stakeholder classification model salience model is a stakeholder classification tool or model that's what it is which classifies stakeholders based on their power or authority their urgency their time bound right and their level of required attention and in a time sensitive manner and their legitimacy, the uh, the proximity or the uh, appropriate involvement of stakeholders, right? Uh, under uh, uh, pro legitimacy talks about uh, the level of involvement with project work. So, when you use a salience model, uses these three uh, different classifications to classify the stakeholders, and it helps you again. Uh, with engagement in the exam, there could be a question on salience model, a classification tool uh, that classifies stakeholders based on power, urgency, and legitimacy. Power is authority. Urgency is uh, the level of attention required in a time-sensitive manner, and legitimacy is proximity or indicating the level of involvement with project works of the project work of the stakeholders. Next slide. Once we have identified the stakeholders, further analyze them. You could analyze them by using the classification tools such as uh, the salience model. You could uh, you could uh, analyze them 
using stakeholder map. You could analyze them using uh, uh, using uh, a cube, three-dimensional uh, way of classifying stakeholders. Once you've analyzed them, you understand the priority. Once you understand the priority, you can create an engagement level for the stakeholders, right? Stakeholder engagement plan helps you with the engagement of stakeholders in an effective fashion. That's what a stakeholder engagement plan. It tells you about uh, the level of participation desired from the stakeholders. And stakeholder engagement plan feeds into the communication management plan also. Now, once you have created the stakeholder register, you got your stakeholder register ready. You have analyzed your stakeholder. It is at this time, you must also start looking into the communication requirements of your stakeholders. Communication requirements, so before we understand the communication requirements, let's define communications a little bit. What is communications? Communication. Communication is two-way relay of, this is important, information. Communication is a two-way relay of information between, between stakeholders, right? A two-way relay of information And communication is effective, and it is communication will be considered effective if we ensure if we ensure that feedback is acted upon in a timely fashion. So communication is two-way relay of information and ensuring that there is a feedback loop is what makes it effective, right? Keep that in mind. Now, good project teams, when they identify the stakeholders, they also start understanding the communication requirements of stakeholders. So communication, the word with communication is uh it's always information right if you if you if someone says map communication to something you'll say well communication is uh communication is information sharing uh that's what communication is right so keep that in mind so let's talk about this another important concept so you have identified your stakeholders and you have created the stakeholder register. You've got your stakeholder register in place. You've got your stakeholder register in place. It is at this time, so stakeholder register in place means that you have identified the stakeholders, you have analyzed your stakeholders, you have prioritized your stakeholders, you have created the engagement plan. Now you are ready to understand, ready to understand the information needs of your stakeholders. So when we say understanding the information needs of your stakeholder, what does that mean? It means what information do our stakeholders need? When would they need it? Frequency of information and what is their preferred communication method? And Developing this understanding of information needs of stakeholders 
and information needs such as what information is required, when they need it, what will be the frequency and what will be the communication method. Communication method could be face-to-face, -face, interactive. Communication method could be an email. Communication method could be a phone to phone call. Communication method could be a meeting. Communication method could be a WebEx call, depending on uh, what the uh, what the stakeholder prefers. Keep it prefer keep prefers keep in mind. Communication method is identified based on the needs of the stakeholders. The stakeholders decide. Now this idea of right here. This idea of understanding the information needs of your stakeholders, the information needs such as what information, when do they need it, what frequency, and what communication method is what is called communication requirement. analysis this will be on your pmp exam what is communication requirement analysis look communication requirement analyzing the communication requirements of who your stakeholders so to perform communication requirement what is one thing that is required your stakeholder register analyzed prioritized an engagement plan put in place helps you plan communication. If you do not have your stakeholder register in place, planning communication would be futile. It will not be, it will be rendered, not very, it will not be very effective, right? Uh, and, and there could be communication failures that may happen if you do not have proper stakeholder analysis done. So we talked about what is communication requirement analysis different communication methods that have been uh, uh, that you could use the communication methods could be verbal electronic media or physical there are these three communication methods that uh, that pmi generally likes to likes likes uh, to test people on push method pull method and the third one right here is the interactive method. So let's talk about them a little bit. So pull, so push, pull, and interactive. One, two, and three. So these are the three communication methods. Interactive method is the most effective method of communication. In the exam, you could find a question on this too. Why is it effective? Because there is no lag. It's like what's, uh, what happens when two people talk at the same time. There is no lag. Why there is no lag? Because it's real time. It's happening in real time. People are communicating back and forth. Very effective. There is no lag and it's real time communication, right? The video that you're watching right now could be more like Another, it's not interactive because it's pre-recorded. Had it been a live WebEx session where participants, participants and I are communicating, it will become even more effective because you will have an opportunity to ask me questions. I will provide, uh, you could be provide me feedback. Uh, I could ask you questions and test your understanding a little bit. And learning is great, right? But uh, so interactive in the exam, you may find some questions, pull method and push method. What is push method? Push method is a method where you identify stakeholders, identify certain stakeholders, and then relay information to these stakeholders. 
relay information to these identified stakeholders. So push method, for example, we just had a meeting, a meeting. After the meeting, <coughs> just to the participants of the meeting, I sent an email. I pushed an email sending them the meeting minutes. I didn't send the meeting minutes to everyone in my stakeholder registers, did I? No, I only sent the meeting minutes to those identified stakeholders who participated in my meeting and needed those meeting minutes because I wanted confirmation from them. Push communication, identified sets, set of stakeholders. Communication is sent to them because they will consume that information. Pull communication is generally communication which could be the entire department is receiving it. The entire enterprise is receiving it. For example, uh, recently Elon Musk sent out an email to all the Tesla employees. Some people may have read that email, some people may not read that email because they felt that it was not useful. For example, Elon Musk could also send an email to all the uh, all the employees telling them about their last quarter. On 27th of uh, January 2023, they came up with their uh, with their sales, and the and the uh, stock for Tesla went up almost 15 percent. It went up 15 percent because the indicators were very strong for them. Their sales were at record level and they were also making some profits here. So everyone received that information. Now, this, this report went to all the employees of Tesla, but some people who did not have any stock option maybe did not even look at it. So pull communication is department or enterprise wide, generally sent to large population. And it could also be large set of data. People may use this information and they may not consume this information, but they are not identified like push communication. So push communication, identified stakeholders, uh, they receive the information. Pull communication, enterprise-wide, department-wide, a policy decision, a procedure uh, that needs to be followed by all the employees. Uh, it could, uh, pull communication is generally for large population and large set of data. Interactive communication, however, remains the most effective way of communicating. PMI is also talked about what is the model of communication. So as part of this uh, identify stakeholder topic, PMI also uh, talks about communication model. Now, it actually sounds very complex, but really think about the picture of communication. So, so look at it, look at it this way. Communication, who is involved in communication? There is a sender who would encode or write the message. Sender will encode or write the message. Sends the message to the receiver. Receiver will decode or read the message. Now sender's responsibility when they're writing the message, it is sender's responsibility to ensure that there is no noise in the message. Which means that there is no ambiguity, there is no unknown. If I'm sending a message to 15 other people, they all should understand the message clearly. There should be no grammar mistake. If I'm sending the message through email, I should write it in a bulleted form so people understand it and if they want to respond to it, they are able to respond to it effectively. I should be aware of the culture uh, because all our teams are diverse. I should know, uh, I should know them better uh, before I draft or craft my message. I should use the technology that everyone has avail uh, that, that is uh, that is available to everyone. I'm sending the email, but 90% of people cannot receive the email. This message is not going to go to them. Noise is any hindrance in receiver's ability to comprehend or understand your message. It could be grammar mistake. It could be technological interference. It could be uh, a lack of awareness of culture. 
it could be any other any other aspect that would hinder receiver's ability to understand your uh, understand your message clearly noise now receiver could decode would read your message decode it could also now encode write a message back to you and now it is receiver's responsibility to write the message with clarity use the right communication method and remove any hindrance in sender's ability to uh, to understand the message feedback so receiver may send some feedback sometimes right and this is this picture is what is called a communication model communication model shows uh, the how communication happens from sender to receiver and sometimes receivers would also encode the message send it back it is the responsibility of the person who is crafting drafting the message to eliminate noise in the message and receivers will generally provide feedback on the message and senders must act must act on it right uh act on that feedback that is being received and pmi has created a picture right here no different than what we created together and finally as part of this topic uh pmi loves this uh this aspect they call it seam stakeholder engagement engagement assessment matrix now stakeholder engagement could be some stakeholders could be leading some stakeholders could be uh, supportive some stakeholders could their engagement level could be neutral some stakeholders, their engagement level could be uh, unaware. And some stakeholders, their engagement level could be resistant. So a stakeholder engagement assessment matrix helps you understand the engage current, helps you understand what does it help you understand with? It helps you understand the current and desired level of engagement of our stakeholders current and the desired level of engagement of our stakeholders for example now if you saw stakeholder engagement assessment matrix uh the engagement levels could be leading which is great supporting not so bad neutral we can work with these stakeholders and bring them on the supportive and leading side unaware we should talk to the stakeholders about our project so that they are aware of our project resistance is immediately uh, the moment we find stakeholders who are high priority and they're resistant towards our project we must start engaging with them working with them and ensuring that we get their we get their buy-in and we are able to bring them to neutral supportive or ideally leading side so stakeholder engagement matrix right here shows stakeholder one two three four five and six shows the current level of stakeholder number three is uh, their current level is neutral the desired level is supportive for stakeholder five their current level is resistant but the desired level is neutral so anytime we the current and the desired level are not where they need to be as project managers we must start working with those stakeholders and try to bring them uh, on side so uh this is all about topic a extremely important from pmp exam standpoint folks so lesson two topic b form the team now it's very important to understand uh two core philosophies uh that define this topic the two core philosophies are our two core approaches are ensuring that we understand team formation 
and project managers role in predictive projects and team formation and project managers role in adaptive or agile based projects so let's say predictive to make it easy for some folks waterfall sometimes predictive approaches are also called traditional approaches so <clears throat> so form the team right forming the team is in predictive approaches it's because it's command and control project managers take the lead and they assemble the team together by acquiring the resources uh, from functional managers by acquiring the resources uh, uh, from other teams and by acquiring the resources of course from uh, <clears throat> using procurement in adaptive teams so we start steering away from command and control and we start uh, focusing on team development and collaboration. So from exam standpoint, collaboration, co-location, and keep in mind, co-location could be physical, but co-location nowadays is virtual, remains the key. And and collaboration remains the key in predictive projects also predictive just because it's command and control or project managers play a very important role in leading the team does not mean that uh, you don't need collaboration you need collaboration everywhere so forming the team from predictive standpoint and forming the team from adaptive standpoint so let's take a look at forming the team as i said uh, in predictive projects right here in predictive projects uh, forming the team is project managers. Uh, one of the project manager's primary responsibilities and uh, the project manager will build the resource management plan and based on that would acquire the resources uh, that would help perform the work of the project. In hybrid as well as adaptive project, the team is empowered the teams are empowered empowered team what does that mean empowered teams are self-organizing and empowered teams are self-directing self-organizing they they are responsible for choosing the work that they will do. They organize the work around. And they because, because they have built this shared understanding of the project. And self-directing, self-directing means you don't need a project manager to direct these teams. These teams are motivated individuals that understand what the vision is and continue to move towards that vision. Most importantly, self-directing teams make local project decisions right they make the local project decisions self-organizing teams uh, are cost functional teams and when, when we say agile teams they are self-organizing and self-directing what does that mean these teams are formed of individuals that are generally t-shaped t-shaped over i-shaped What does that mean? T-shaped individuals are those uh, team members that specialize in one area, but also have knowledge of other areas. They have knowledge of other areas, T-shaped. I-shaped individuals generally specialize in one area. And now think about it like this, that Imagine a predictive project and you got I-shaped individuals and suddenly one of the team members, critical team members left. No one else knows about the work that they performed. So what is impacted? The project is impacted. And it is very important for project managers, whether you're working in predictive projects or, uh, or adaptive projects to be servant leaders. Uh, or, or in other words, we can say that project managers should value servant leadership 
irrespective of what organization type and what product approach is being used. We value sovereignty leadership and apply appropriate leadership style. Key, key in current project management landscape leadership style. Apply appropriate leadership style, but value servant leadership. Now, what is servant leadership? Servant leadership, if, uh, if I were to speak about servant leadership, I'd say that servant leadership is, let's see if we can get a new slide here, and then we will speak about servant leadership here and let's change the layout to a blank layout so servant leadership popularized by agile projects and i said let's value servant leadership but apply the appropriate leadership style on the project so servant leadership first of all their servant leaders, their role is to remove any impediments that come in the path of teams doing the work, right? Come in the path of the team. Uh, and they, that is and some impediments that are becoming hindrance in their ability to do the work. Remove, uh, remove the independent, uh, remove, uh, remove the impediments. That's number one. Number two, and another critical uh, critical task of a servant leader is to facilitate as required, as required, and let the team be, and let the team be because teams are self-organizing, teams are self-directing, teams are self-motivated, motivated, so they know exactly what needs to happen. Facilitate. Uh, when required, coach and mentor, not only the team, but also the stakeholders on what? Agile principles. And the idea is to help build the mindset called the agile mindset. So remove the impediment, impediments, facilitate as required, coach and mentor. And another critical task is to shield the team from any external interferences. Or in the PMP exam, there are some questions around one of, in, in, you're working in an agile project, you're the PM and one of the stakeholders is continuously uh, nudging a team member and asking for some reports, a good PM or servant leadership style would be to speak to the stakeholder and request them to send all the requests to you, the PM and or the coach and let the team member be so that they can perform the work uh, in an uninterrupted fashion. Number five, celebrate team's accomplishments, small or big. accomplishments. They could be small, they could be big, but they should be celebrated. So these are some of the roles of uh, a servant leader. Uh, I think all the roles of a servant leader and you will find all these roles and questions around all these roles in your exam. You must memorize these five and understand their application. Very important because scenario on the PNP exam, they've been built around these. You know, there are two kinds of leadership style. It could be centralized leadership style or a distributed leadership model or management model. Predictive projects are generally more, uh, there is a centralized model where we have uh, the project managers and the team members or leads, they report into this. Uh, this uh, project manager, this this person who is leading the team, but there is also distributed 
leadership and management model where where team members based on their capabilities they will assume the the role of a facilitator or a leader at that point of time sometimes also called uh, you could have assigned leadership and 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 so centralized model generally is based on assigned leadership there is a leader and then uh, team members and team leads report into this leader. A sick predictive model, distributed model is more, uh, more uh, geared towards agile adaptive approaches. And the idea is for any team member based on their capabilities to assume the role of a leader or a facilitator at a certain point of time. Distributed leadership style, we should try to create uh, uh, create teams where there is distributed leadership style. The idea is not generally to have assigned leadership, uh, but empower the team team members in such a way that they uh, they all are willing to assume leadership role when the work falls in their level of specialization or, or expertise. The next slide speaks about the different roles in project management. Uh, look, in Agile projects, we could have the role of a product owner, Agile coaches, Scrum masters, or sometimes called Agile PMs or team leads. The team members, the team, the core team, and key stakeholders, these four roles. In predictive projects, though, these we have vast number of stakeholders and team members. So there is a PM, uh, which is more like centralized PM. And then we have team members, subject matter experts, sponsors, the leadership team, such as the executive sponsors, sponsors, the sponsors rep, uh, and, and the team size, because predictive projects generally would have the size, team size to be, to be larger as compared to adaptive projects where teams are more nimble. Uh, the, the roles also vary. T-shaped, we talked about T-shaped individuals. T-shaped individuals are those individuals uh, that specialize in one area. They have specialization in one core area, but they also know about other areas. How are these T-shaped members created? T-shaped members are created. First, first signs of T-shaped members and, and the, this, this term, uh, it was seen on co-located teams where Teams would sit together. They specialize, team members would specialize in their areas, but because there was this constant collaboration and communication that would go on among the teams, team members would hear about each other's work. And slowly, uh, they, from I-shaped individuals, they became more T-shaped individuals. In Agile projects, this uh, the, uh, we acquire team members because the teams are small and we acquire them to be T-shaped. And the reason we want them to be T-shaped is because we uh, we want teams to be able to assume other roles if required in the absence of other team members. T-shaped members are not, they're not born with these skills. They are, uh, they become T-shaped because they are trained, they are coached, and a culture is created where such individuals uh, could be developed. Now, the next slide speaks about, of course, whether you're in predictive projects or you're in adaptive or, or projects, the current uh, landscape is that the teams are formed from various uh, uh, various cultures. Uh, they're they're, they have different experiences. They're different age, right? Uh, so it's very important to encourage or create a culture of diversity, equity, equity, and and inclusion. So it's key in project management because when we encourage such culture, uh, collaboration will take place in the right spirit. Team norms and team charter. Team norms are expected behaviors of the team, and who should? Who should build team norms? The entire team together establishes the norms. Entire team. 
in the exam, there will be a question with the wrong choice, such as a PM. No, it is the entire team. They collaborate and they put together uh, the team norm. Team norms are ways of working. For example, we're going to meet every Tuesday. For example, the Tuesday meeting would be uh, co-located co uh, and would be done in the office. For example, how communication will take place. For example, different methods of conflict resolution. For example, how decisions will be made if the team feels stuck. All those are team norms and team norms are documented in a team charter. Team charter contains both team norms, which are listed here, along with team norms, charter also contains ground rules. Ground rules are expected, acceptable, and unacceptable behavior of the team. These are code of ethics, right? Uh, and and uh, acceptable and unacceptable behavior of team, mem team members. Again, teams are responsible for putting together the ground rules. And ground rules and, uh, and team norms are part of the team charter. Now, if you take a look at here, what does a team charter contains? It contains shared values, behavior guidelines. How are we going to communicate and the communication tools that will be used? Decision making guideline, performance ex 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 expectations, conflict resolution methods, when are we going to meet? What will be the timing of the meeting? What channel will be used for meeting? It could be co-located meeting. It could be uh, virtually co-located. What will be the frequency of a meeting? It could be bi-weekly, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and other team agreements on hours of working and some improvement activities. Apart from that, team charter also contains acceptable and unacceptable team behaviors, also called the ground rules, right? So, and 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 if you uh, and then team norms are are uh, the ways of working. And those ways of working are generally listed here. These are the ways of working. So let's move on to the next slide. Communication. Keep in mind, PMP loved this question. And it'll say, what is the most effective way of communication? Face-to-face -face or interactive communication with adequate feedback loop is the most effective way of uh, communication, but there are other ways, verbal and nonverbal. Nonverbal is also called body language. Almost, they say 70 to 80% of our communication is body language, right? Uh, or nonverbal cues. Good project managers will not only uh, not only pay attention to having interactive communication, but also pay close attention to body language and address any gaps if they see uh, certain signs of uh, or, or gaps in the uh, due to body language. So you could uh, you could communicate uh, there could be uh, verbal communication there could be written communication and of course face to face remains the most effective way of communicating virtual teams keep in mind virtual teams have the same shared goals as geographically co-located teams. So if the virtual teams have the same shared goals as geographically co-located teams, then we should ensure that we engage and support them 
same way as we will support them, support our co-located teams, geographically co-located teams. And now it is becoming normal to have distributed teams, teams that are physically co-located along with the teams that are geographically dispersed or virtually, we are also calling them virtually co-located nowadays. We're creating that kind of a culture where the teams feel uh, and everyone feels, uh, feels like home. So uh, creating opportunities uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for an organization. That's what happens when you establish virtual teams. You create, uh, you create opportunities such as uh, availability of resources that would generally not be available in your physical location. The work-life balance, avoiding the re re uh, relocation, uh, relocation uh, expenses, and better skill set lower costs. Virtual teams have one of the challenges. The challenge could be uh, a bonding challenge and how we can we overcome, the, overcome them. We can overcome them by using the right kind of communication uh, methods, right kind of communication technology. It is strongly recommended. And in the PMP exam too, we'll find some questions around this. It is strongly recommended that virtual teams uh, project managers and the team leads, they use the right kind of communication technology, ideally uh, video conferencing, so that we can address those body language challenges also. Virtual team challenges, right? So uh, overcome these challenges by using the right kind of technology. How do you work with virtual teams. We should continuously keep checking with the virtual team members to see that everything is fine. We should keep them engaged. We should support them whenever uh, whenever there is a need, keeping in mind that virtual teams have the, have, they have the same shared goal as our co-located teams, keeping that in mind. Engage them, support them, uh, and, and, and sometimes have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them to understand that they are, they're not, this feeling of isolation is not there because that's what can happen. That's what can happen when you're working with virtual teams, this feeling of isolation and overcome them by using the right kind of communication methods. Ideally, uh, some teams, uh, they're, whenever uh, teams are virtual, they ensure that everyone has cameras on, can see each other, uh, and, and it just changes the way of working. Various different virtual uh, uh, team communication technologies, their task boards, virtual task board, we could have messaging and chats, we could have shared calendars, uh, shared documentation storage in IT-based project. Nowadays, we are using Confluence and Jira boards. Everyone is able to see uh, almost everything about the project is, is made readily available to the team members. Uh, those knowledge repositories or shared folders, which are shared across the board. And of course, as I said, one of the challenges of virtual teams, working with virtual teams is the feeling of isolation. How can we overcome them by using sometimes the right kind of technology and video conferencing helps. And that brings us to the end of topic B. So what have we covered up till now? We looked at topic A, which is the most important topic from lesson two, start the project. So start the project, lesson two, Topic A, we looked at identify and engage stakeholders. Then we looked at topic B, was forming the team. Do it as early as possible and ensure that when you're working with virtual teams, you keep them engaged, you keep them supported. There are quite a few questions on virtual team and now the topic C, which is building shared understanding. Building shared understanding about the project, about the project. Who is responsible for it? The coach or the PM, depending on the nature of the project you're working on. They're responsible for building shared understanding. How do you build shared understanding? We build shared understanding by communicating the vision, project vision, and the need to the team. 
and this does not happen uh, uh, on on day one, day two, day three. It is a continuous process. We continue to do it throughout the life cycle of a project. Good project managers will have not just one kickoff meeting before they start executing the project. They could have numerous kickoff meetings before they start executing the project. And and the idea is to uh, ensure that we continue to build that or continue to have that shared understanding of the project. So moving on to our next slide. It is very important for project managers, team leaders, agile coaches, uh, scrum masters, delivery managers, or anyone who is leading a team uh, to ensure that our teams, they understand where we are heading to, right? They all understand the vision. And how do we achieve that? We achieve that by continuously communicating the vision to the team. And do we start doing that as early as possible? Good project managers will review historical artifacts such as business documents, such as some of the business documents. And uh, these could be business cases, benefit management plans, some high level uh, uh, strategic document, a strategic plan could be one of those. Project manager, if they're given an opportunity, they may also look at the vision uh, of the organization as well as the project. And once they have established the understanding around the business need, the project vision, they start doing that. Uh, they start doing that with the team too. And it is not a one-time exercise. It is a it is an exercise uh, that continues to happen throughout the life cycle of the project. Keep in mind, communication of vision or building shared understanding uh, of the project with the team is not an event. It is a process that happens throughout the life cycle of the the project. Now let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at a new slide and slide oh let's change the to blank let's control so that's in a predictive project before the project starts Let's call it pre-project. Organization has a vision. They have a strategic plan, which contains various different business needs. There could be a needs document. There could be a business case, plus the benefit management plan. So good project managers, good leaders, when they join the organization, let's say during early stages or initiating of the project, they would review these needs document, the business cases, the benefit management plan, and to some extent would also look at the business need. They would develop understanding of this and then right in the beginning itself they will start communicating this communicating the need vision and the need and they will continue to do this throughout the life cycle so that every team member understands where are we heading to what is the vision and what need are we uh, are we addressing here? What problem are we solving? And what opportunities, opportunity or opportunities are we trying to exploit? That's what business need is. So good project managers will take a look at that. Uh, and, and using this information, the needs, the business cases, in the early stages, organizational leadership would also use this information. And using this information, they will create a document called the project charter document. Now, from PMP exam standpoint, it is very important 
to understand this, that a project charter Who creates it? It is the sponsoring organization. Keep this in mind. You may disagree because in your organization, you may be creating it at this point of time, but from PMP exam standpoint, it is the sponsoring organization. However, the PM, if they are already acquired at this stage, they may support this process, right? It is highly recommended that they support this process. Why is the project charter created? It is created to authorize the project. What does authorization mean? Authorization means that the project can now move to planning. Classic predictive approach, right? Who, who creates the project charter is the sponsoring organization. What is the role of a PM during this stage? If they are acquired, they must support this process or uh, project managers may also create the project charter uh, if the organizational leadership or the sponsoring organization, organization, organization mandates that. But from exam standpoint, your right choice will be sponsoring organizations supported by the project manager if the project manager is available. Why is it created? Authorization of project uh, happens when the project charter gets signed off, right? When it is signed off, project gets authorized. What does authorization mean? Authorization of a project means that the project can now go into planning and the project manager has been given the authority to now use organizational resources for this project and maybe start with planning process. So, so there we go. So uh, building shared understanding of the project, understand the need, understand the business case, understand the project vision. Then using that, when you come to initiating of the project, start uh, building the project charter and an organizational leadership executive committee or the sponsoring organ or sponsoring organization are, uh, are the ones who would create that project charter. Building shared understanding is about sharing the project vision and agreements. It is about working with the team and agreeing uh, agreeing on it or negotiating and finally upholding these agreements throughout the life cycle of the project. Project vision. What is project vision? Project vision is the desired future state or in other words, where do I want to be? That one line statement created by the sponsoring organization. They're responsible for creating this. And project vision statement is a statement that must be referred to throughout the life cycle of the project, throughout the life cycle of the project. Now, uh, sometimes we also see that project vision serves as a constant reminder to the team and teams must continue to refer to the stadium to align their, uh, uh, refer to the, to the statement to align their work with the vision so that we continue to move towards that desired future state. It serves at that, uh, as, uh, uh, as a reminder to the project team. Now, as I said, the two documents, the pre-project documents, the pre-project documents, and it is, these are created 
is created by the organization. Project managers do not play any, remote, uh, any role in creation of these documents because project managers are acquired during the project. These documents are created pre-project. A business case is the justification of the business need. A business case is uh, serves uh, as as a, uh, serves uh, in many ways as a document that will not only justify the business need but also provide a clear uh, 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 provide a very clear uh, you know problem or opportunity statement and and problem and opportunity statement happens to be. Uh, one of the one of the first things that you will see in a business case some uh, some standards have also defined a business case as a formal declaration of the intent of an organization documented in the form of a business need which could be uh, a problem statement or an opportunity statement projects uh, are authorized or projects are initiated by when when the approval of a business need takes place the projects are initiated during this time when project is initiated is when we write the uh, the project charter now before sometimes uh, developing the business need organization at a high level may also document uh, the business need in a business need document business need document contains very high level list of deliverable and is generally a prerequisite to the business case. Business need document clearly defines the business need, the clear outcomes, along with uh, who would be uh, uh, who would be responsible for delivering the business needs. Good project managers, they are constantly looking uh, for opportunities to communicate, uh, communicate the vision and ensure that uh, ensure that uh, organizational uh, resources, you know, they understand uh, the vision and, and this happens by communicating the vision constantly. There are two ways uh, that PMI suggests or has recommended on predictive as well as uh, uh, adaptive projects where we could use certain methods to communicate the message. In predictive projects, we could use kickoff meetings. We could communicate uh, or, or build shared understanding of the vision by socializing the project charter. On adaptive projects though, uh, a product box exercise or XP metaphor. Product box exercise is something that is conducted in the beginning itself in adaptive projects, where uh, where uh, you could you could work with the customer, the product owner, and key stakeholders, and understand their likes and dislikes, and where do they see or perceive value. Just like a marketer in a shop who would speak about uh, a product uh, and then talk about its feature uh, to, to the to the to the customer. Now, uh, products box, product box exercise is done to understand the likes and dislikes and where do stakeholders perceive value? Where do they see value? And then we understand the customer uh, view really well. Now, XP metaphor, right? Metaphor is uh, a very simple way of communicating what the project is all about. XP metaphor, uh, this, the idea of XP metaphor comes from agile approach. One of the agile approaches, which is called the extreme programming approaches, extreme programming approach. And uh, the idea is to speak about an ex extremely complex project in a very simplified form. For example, uh, an organization working on uh, uh, working on a cybersecurity project may call uh, call it building Great Wall of China, communicating that the vision by using simple terms that may not literally mean uh, what, what, what is being done, but enough to provide understanding of what the journey is. How do you get these agreements 
or 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 how do you get an agreement on on project agreements how do you uh, how would you do that? One of the things that we do early in predictive projects and even so in agile projects is by developing a project charter. A project charter is a document that is created during the early stages of a project. And early stages is created, project charter is created in the early stages and contains high level information. High level information about what? High level information about scope, sketch, high level information about schedule, high level information about cost, high level information about resources and stakeholders, high level information about any preferred vendors, high level information around risks, high level risks and high level requirements. Apart from that, a project charter would also contain some of the elements from the business case, such as vision. It would also contain, project charter would also contain elements such as uh, name of the stakeholder, name of the, sorry, name of the sponsor, and the PM, if the PM is already assigned at this time, the project charter may also contain information such as uh, assumptions and maybe to some extent some of the limitations or constraints. And another critical component of project charter is that success criteria of the project is listed here. And one final thing, sometimes recent, sometimes seen on the exam is the authority of the PM could also be listed as part of the project charter. So what does a project charter contain? And we talked about who creates it, the sponsoring organization. Why do they create it to authorize the project so that the project can move into planning? Created in the early stages and once the project charter is signed off is when the project goes into planning. It contains high level information. Folks, this is very important, high level information. High level scope and requirements, high level schedule, high level cost, high level resources and stakeholders, high level uh, preferred vendors, if there are any vendors that have already been chosen, risks, uh, name of the project uh, manager, as well as the sponsor, the project manager, if they are not assigned, it will not be there, that information assumptions as well as constraints, success criteria and authority of the PM. So keep that in mind. Uh, it is very important to know this because in the exam, they could, you could have four to six questions from here. So we talked about project charter uh, in detail. Now, what does we have talked about? What does a project charter contain? And then PMI has provided a template of a project charter. Again, keeping in mind that project charter contains only high level information. Another important thing that project charter contains is about cost. And this is very high level. Sometimes this is called rough order of magnitude. PMI suggests that rough order of magnitude or this range or the cost range of this budget should be anywhere between minus 25 percent to plus 75 percent. Minus 25 percent to plus 75 percent. So if a project is million dollar, you could expect the project to be anywhere between 750k to 1.75k. But keep this in mind, every organization has its own threshold. They've established their own organizational range in these early stages. This is PMI range, minus 25 to plus 75, also called the rough order of magnitude. In our organization, you may, in your organization, you may hear things like L1, L2, L3 uh, estimates. These are the earliest est estimates because we only have information available at a very high level. 
because it is at a very high level, that's why the range is wide. When you go into planning, you have you start getting definitive information. And when you start getting definitive information, it is at this time your estimate, this range also starts shrinking. Right? You may use tools such as work breakdown structure, etc., to to increase the accuracy in this in estimate. So during planning, at the end of planning, it's not rough order of magnitude anymore. It is definitive order of magnitude. And the confidence in the estimate increases considerably at the end of planning. In the early stages or initiating, the confidence in the estimate is not very high because we have high level information. When we go into planning, we got more information, accuracy increases, and uh, when the project management plan, which contains this definition, definitive order of magnitude, is signed off, we go into executing. And we will be talking about planning in our next lesson. So organizations, now this is very important. Uh, if, you, if you read PIMBOL guide four or five, uh, and uh, to some extent six also, you would see that kickoff ha meeting happens once at the end of planning and before going into executing, but that's not true. Kickoff meeting continues to happen uh, till uh, when we uh, till we st uh, start uh, executing. You could have initial kickoff meeting with smaller team, and as the team size increases during planning, you can have other kickoff meetings. The goal of kickoff meeting is to help build shared understanding of the project. The goal of the kickoff meeting is to communicate the vision. The goal of the kickoff meeting is to bring team on teams on board and it assists in team formation. It assists in team formation also. Uh, so organizations, as uh, we see here, it's all about, it may be about to announce project initiation. It is, it could also be done to build shared understanding on the vision. It could be done to identify sponsor stakeholders. It could be also done to uh, include some high level items in the project charter. And some of the some of the kickoff meetings can also take place during planning. There's this one large kickoff meeting uh, that happens at the end of planning just before going into executing uh, to one more time speak about uh, the vision the value, the high level requirements, what approach is being taken so that the teams uh, agree uh, agree on, uh, uh, on, on or, or the teams now have shared understanding of the project. This is end of topic C. Now we've gone through topic A, gone through topic A, which was identify stakeholders. Gone through topic B, forming the team. Looked at topic C, building shared understanding of the project. Understanding, and we do this by looking at the business case, the needs document, benefit management plan, development of project charter, and kickoff meeting. Now we are at, or we will be covering the last topic for lesson number one, starting the project. And the last topic is product approach. Product approach, methodology, various approaches, predictive, adaptive, and hybrid. Let's talk about these approaches a little bit. So right here, let's open a new slide. Approaches, product approaches. Predictive, sometimes also called waterfall. We could call it traditional approaches and plan heavy or plan driven approaches hybrid and we have adaptive also called change driven 
and could be called agile based approaches and combination of these two approaches are the hybrid approaches which uh, may imbibe the behavior of predictive as well as adaptive for me uh, hybrid approaches are more leaning towards adaptive the idea is to use the agile mindset as much as possible on our projects right what is that agile mindset or agile value system i i feel that the the mindset agile value system could be applied to both predictive and adaptive project because the value system is based on agile value system is based on individuals and interaction i'm going to go over the other side here but let's just talk about the value system working solution agile value system is based on customer collaboration and agile mindset or value system is based on our ability to respond to change stay nimble so here we go individuals and interactions working solution customer collaboration responding to change. apply them on both predictive and adaptive project right we could apply these we should focus on uh having interactions continuously throughout the life cycle of the project with our stakeholders with our people we should focus on building or solving the problem and we can only solve the problem or exploit opportunities by building the right solution we should focus on collaborating with customers uh, the belief system that collaboration with customers should happen in the beginning of the project and then it's done that's not true it should continue to happen throughout the project and finally, our ability to respond to change. The world around us is changing faster and even, even uh, uh, faster now. So uh, if it is changing so fast, it is very important to apply or use approaches in such a manner that we stay nimble and we are able to respond to these changes that are taking place. The idea is to create a product that satisfies our customer. The idea is to create a product that creates a delightful and exciting experience for our stakeholders. The idea is to achieve the highest level of satisfaction with our stakeholders. So use the uh, use various approaches, right? You could use various approaches, predictive, uh, and then within predictive, many other approaches. You could use adaptive, you could use hybrid, but I think we must keep these four ideas in mind always. Now, if you wanted to learn about predictive and adaptive approaches or the approaches, you could take a look at www.educationedge.ca. You can go to our, our Knowledge Center page. Go to our Knowledge Center page or you could go to click on the resource page and under the resource page you will find two buttons one is knowledge center and the other is our blogs take a look at the knowledge center and in knowledge center you will find a video on all about predictive and adaptive approaches it's a two hour and 40 minutes video and it talks about this topic d in detail now at a very high level i'm going to talk about the approaches at a very very high level but you can you can always go to this uh, uh go to the top uh, go to the knowledge center and look at all uh, look at look at this video on adaptive and predictive approaches at a very high level predictive approaches they would you know they would start with understanding the requirements or needs once requirements or needs have been understood they'll go into analysis and design for most of these requirements from the stakeholders so 
you had 74 requirements you will design for 74 or maybe most of the requirement design for most of the requirements here right you can design for most of the requirements you will develop for most of the requirements you will test these requirements and finally you will deploy or release release the idea is to take a journey from the beginning to the end and create a near complete product service or result that's what predictive is right but because of this time horizon sometimes we lose that window of opportunity because this time horizon is so long and because uh, predictive approaches uh, generally constrain we constrain changes right will not take too many changes sometimes the product that we create in those uh, two uh, one two three years sometimes the cutting edge is lost sometimes the value that you are planning to deliver because now your competitors also came came with the product it the value is diminished or minimized so predictive projects work very very well for construction predictive projects or predictive approaches they uh, would be used in a shipping industry but there are opportunities uh, in it based projects and other industries now where you could use adaptive approaches right for example in it projects uh, we are using scrum extreme programming in manufacturing we've started using kanban as the, as the preferred approach so adaptive projects also start with requirements or understanding the needs these needs are documented in the product backlog in agile based projects in some approaches we could call these requirements as user stories of stakeholders now your product backlog may contain 74 requirements but you only plan to deliver maybe 10 requirements from these 74 requirements 10 requirements you develop these 10 requirements you test these 10 requirements and you deliver these 10 requirements and this could call called iteration number one number one now out of the 74 requirements you only delivered 10 requirements so what do you do now you take again take a look at these 74 requirements these 74 requirements from there you again plan this time you may plan for another five requirements which are critical and highly prioritized you may develop them again you may test them and you may deliver them again and have some kind of a retrospective now you've delivered 15 requirements and this could be called iteration number two and you will continue moving in this manner the product backlog is an open document and you could add you could add to product backlog however during an iteration you do not uh, you do, would not take more changes from stakeholder. You only deliver what was agreed upon as part of that iteration. But if that requirement was of uh, was critical in nature, right? Was of extreme need to stakeholders. What would happen is in the very next iteration, you would come and deliver that. These iterations could be anywhere between one to four weeks. So within next one to four weeks, you could also come up with something that was not initially planned so uh, adaptive approaches are iterative in nature value delivery could be sooner here and product backlog remains which is like a requirement document of predictive project remains an open document 
during an iteration, during this journey, for example, iteration number one, no new requirements apart from what was decided as part of initial planning no, will not be delivered. If a stakeholder wants something during an iteration, the team would request it to be added to the product backlog. And I'll hear this well, product owners would be responsible for ensuring or would be responsible for prior prioritization. And, and if they feel that the requirement provided by stakeholder is of is critical in nature, is of urgent, uh, has certain level of urgency, or it is if it is required in the very next iteration, that would be added to that plan or sometimes called the iteration iteration log of that iteration. So keep in mind adaptive projects would create a small increments of the product and continue to elaborate on that initial increment uh, and create the product. The idea is to somehow create a working solution and deliver value sooner. Hybrid projects are a combination of both predictive and adaptive approaches. You could use hybrid approach, uh, you could use in hybrid projects, you could use adaptive approaches for predictive approaches for requirement gathering and maybe planning. And then you could use adaptive approaches for execution and delivery of the project. It could be incremental in development but in the initial stages of requirement and planning, you could be uh, uh, predictive. So it's combination hybrid hybrid projects or hybrid approaches are combination of both predictive and adaptive, right? So uh, so uh, to learn more about agile scrum approach, go take a look at please take a look at our uh, videos that are hosted on our website, and uh, and it speaks about adaptive and predictive approaches in detail. In the exam, though, there are quite a few questions on Agile Scrum, and it is very important to understand uh, Agile Scrum, and that has also been discussed as part of our, uh, as part of our, uh, part of our video on our website, right? So as we said before, predictive approaches right here are plan-driven, sequential in nature and the idea is that change is, change is possible but it is controlled we constrain it right and the product is delivered at the end whereas adaptive approaches right here are change driven changes are easy here they are delivered in iterations and increments and time boxed right uh, when when are they best suited? When there is less less certainty. When clarity on requirements is not there, then use adaptive. When the requirements are clear, there is clarity. Requirements are very stable. Use predictive, right? So that's important. And then predictive projects. The product is delivered in the end or value delivery happens late. Sometimes because of this window of opportunity is lost. Whereas on adaptive project, you have this opportunity to deliver value and, and gain feedback and ensure that this product becomes the best version, right? Best possible version. So, so that's about uh, predictive adaptive and hybrid at a very high level. In the PMI authorized PMP exam prep though, the details have been provided more details. As part of our video also, we have provided more details because predictive and adaptive are subjects. They're, they're, uh, they're uh, subject in, them, in themselves. So uh, it is very difficult to explain them. And from exam standpoint also the entire uh, standard speaks about predictive, adaptive, as well as uh, hybrid projects. So developing understanding of predictive as well as adaptive projects is extremely important. For today, as part of lesson two, starting the project, we went over four topics. And these four topics, number one, identify stakeholders and engage them. Number two, we learned about forming a team in both predictive, adaptive, 
projects and also uh, the hybrid projects. Number three, uh, we learned about uh, the, uh, the idea of building shared understanding of the project and doing this early on the project. And number four, we learned about at a very high level approaches on the project uh, to be used on projects. You could use adaptive, you could use predictive, or you could use hybrid. So four topics in lesson two as part of PMI authorized PMP exam prep version 3.0 2023. It's very important uh, for, for this current PMP certification to develop the agile mindset. Apply it wherever possible. Value servant leadership. Extremely important, whether you're working in predictive or adaptive projects. In the exam, you won't find questions saying, well, in an adaptive project or predictive project, they will say, what is servant leadership for you? And there'll be questions relating to, uh, to that behavior, right? Identification of stakeholder topic A remains the core topic of lesson number two, starting the project. Read it carefully if you want to do well on the PMP certification exam. At Education Edge, our goal is to provide the best possible uh, knowledge base to our students. And in an effort to ensure that people are able to consume this new PMI authorized PMP exam prep version three, we have put together this series of videos to help you understand this, uh, this new landscape of project management where there is high stress on using adaptive approaches or the agile mindset. That's it. Uh, this is it for today from us. We'll be back with lesson number three, planning the project. Extremely interesting project from predictive, again, adaptive and hybrid standpoint. How do we plan the project? Till that time, uh, have a great, uh, uh, a great week. Enjoy the learning. And the idea is to let's get PMP certified.